Good morning, everyone. Here we are again for conversations with colleagues. Uh, as you're all aware, we do roughly monthly presentations, usually by Penn State faculty on the fourth to Thursday of the month. And uh, what I've been able to do is to assemble a number of experts in the field of earth materials and social sciences. We've had a few other disciplines talk to us over the last three years. Um, and we'd like to give the opportunity for the residents to ask questions. We used to have that opportunity over lunch, Erica, where we treat the speaker, however, with the COVID stuff. I guess I'll have to take a rain check and take you to lunch some other time. All right. um, today, we have Erica Smithwick. Erica <laughs> is going to talk about the role of wildfire on ecosystems function. It's a really interesting topic, very germane to recent act, uh, things that have happened on the West Coast, for example. Erica earned her bachelor's degree in geology and environmental sciences at Tufts, an MS in forestry resource converse, uh, conservation, the University of Montana, and then received her PhD at Oregon State. She is our E. Willard and Ruby S. Miller Professor of Geography in the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences. And she also serves in a number of other administrative roles in very uh, the active institutes such as the Institutes for Energy and the Environment and the Ecology Institute. Erica won our Wilson Award several years ago now, isn't it? Two, three years ago for excellence in research in the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences. She joins a very august group of researchers uh, going back 30 years. Um, she serves on many, many, many different committees and has given numerous interviews and documentaries, for example, on WPSU, National Geographic, et cetera. Her research interests include how disturbances such as wildfires affect the ecosystem carbon storage and nutrient cycling, and how that in turn can maybe also affect uh, or influence uh, the climate and social ecological resilience and sustainability. She concentrates her work here in the United States and also in Africa. So with that, Erica, I'm gonna quit screen sharing and I'm gonna let you do your thing and uh, we'll go from there. Great, thanks so much, John. And um, I wish we were doing this in person. Uh, maybe maybe you'll have me back someday and we can, we can do it again. Um, but for now, I hope you'll, um, be entertained for a little bit. I'm going to talk about wildfire um, and I'm going to take us on a little journey. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about my work in Africa today, although I'm happy happy to discuss that at the end, uh, but I am going to uh, take us through a lot of news that you've been hearing about recently um, in terms of our, our struggle with managing fire. Uh, from a sort of Western civilization perspective, uh, we can trace this back uh, from a storytelling perspective to Prometheus. This is the Titan who, who is, um, according to legend, stole fire from the gods and gave it to, to humans. And we have forever since been uh, struggling with this relationship with fire. On one hand, we have Tom Hanks and Castaway and you know, the importance of fire to life. Uh, we can now uh, trace this back to the birth of civilization and the development of agriculture and, and, and so on. But we also, of course, are struggling with the fact that we have too much fire in other places. And this is causing billions of dollars of damage to our infrastructure, let alone to our ecosystems and unfortunately deaths to, to communities and wildfire fighters. So this, this balance of how we respect fire, but also manage it is something that we are going to be grappling with in the next uh, few decades. So, um, you know, many of you may be familiar with Smokey Bear and, uh, you know, this was a real bear, a cub that was uh, sort of rescued from some forest fires down in Arizona or New Mexico. And, uh, and yet he became iconic in terms of our messaging around wildfires, particularly around um, post-World War II era where we really were thinking about uh, conserving our natural resources. And so fire was seen as damaging that. 
Um, only you can prevent the madness, for example, being some of some of the messaging there. Um, Smokey recently celebrated 75 years, one of the more, um, in fact, up there in the most uh, successful advertising campaigns. Um, he still he still is uh, singing his tune. Uh, this is a picture of my daughter. She's actually now going to go to Penn State next year, so this is a bit dated. Um, but about a decade ago, a little bit more than that, uh, you know, he could be seen in uh, parks, local parks around Pennsylvania, and he comes to the Bullsburg Fire Parade. So Smokey is still very much present. His uh, logo has actually changed a bit, though, because it used to be only you can prevent wildfires. Um, I'm sorry, it's a, it used to be only you can prevent forest fires, as you see here on this uh, image on the right. But now it's only you can prevent wildfires. So there is this increasing recogni recognition that um, as we learn more about the ecology of, of forests and their relationship with fire, there are some places, some forests that actually require fire to, to regenerate. And I'm gonna talk about that today. So not all fire is bad. But what we're really worried about are these unnatural or novel wildfire systems um, that are increasingly creeping into our systems. And a good part of it is due to fire suppression policies um, in, in the past hundred years that have essentially removed fire uh, from the landscape where it would have naturally occurred. And you have this fuel buildup. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, here's, here's another iconic uh, animal though, um, a sloth. Of course, uh, what's the relationship between a sloth and smoky bear? Well, um, in two, 2019, not too long ago, uh, you may remember in the news, there was a fair amount of wildfire happening in Brazil around the Amazon. This actually wasn't one of the largest fire years, uh, but it was a large one um, if you look back at the historical record. And so this is happening in areas that are not uh, traditionally used to fire. It's happening because of, um, for a number of reasons, primarily agricultural development associated with deforestation of these otherwise wet tropical systems. And so the more you, you creep fire into these systems, the more they dry out because the canopy opens and so they, it promotes even more fire. So there becomes a positive feedback there on the ecosystem. So um, why did this happen? Um, this is sort of an aerial image. It's kind of a confusing one. That blue thing in the middle almost looks like a guitar to me, but it's actually a bulldozer. Uh, this is a bulldozer and you, and you can see here the uh, juxtaposition of the Amazon forest on the right with a large scale agricultural system on the left. And so the message here is that a lot of the fires are not happening by small scale agriculture they're actually happening because of large wildfires due to large uh, scale agriculture for soy and in this case, cattle grazing. Um, so we're really replacing forests with uh, the systems that look like this for grazing. And of course, this is connected to global markets, right? Our demand for beef and soy internationally is driving the pressures on governments to um, see the incentive for converting uh, Amazon forests to uh, agricultural systems. So when we think about fire, we really start to think about this as being really complex and tied with many social dynamics. It's about politics. This is Bolsonaro there, um, who is credited with relaxing some of the protections on the Amazon forest, but it's also due to illegal um, uh, you know, encroachment into these systems on the bottom left there, you see uh, some of these uh, being actually illegal, uh, you know, deforestation events happening within forests that are often lands of indigenous people. So we have this uh, connection now between wildfires and how wildfires are affecting the global climate, but it's also very much tied to how people are um, having access to the land and using the land. And then that feeds back then into social unrest and social justice that then ties back into politics. So, so wildfire is very complex and touches on many aspects of how, how we, um, we want to live in this world. At the same time that uh, the Amazon was getting a lot of attention for wildfires, um, literally at the same time on the other pole of the earth, we had more wildfires happening in uh, the Arctic and tundra ecosystems in boreal forests of Russia. And here you can see a remote sensing image. You can see the smoke. There are clouds in this image as well, but the hazy hazy bit is actually smoke coming from fires. And so we have at the same time of 
we have in the same year, we have the Arctic burning and we have the tropical forest burning. And as someone who has studied wildfire for the past several decades, this is quite an alarming signal uh, to see you know, these different kinds of ecosystems on fire at essentially mm. the same time. Uh, just another few images of, of how this is affecting ecosystems in the area. And these are, again, areas that are not used to, to seeing large fire. And the problem here in the Arctic is that when they are burning, they're burning through peat and this really deep, rich organic carbon uh, in the soils that has taken hundreds to thousands of years to build up. So in terms of, again, positive feedbacks on changes in climate, um, these are some of the things that we worry about uh, as ecologists and, and um, global fire ecologists. And then, of course, uh, the next, very next year, we started to see wildfire out west. So this is a remote sensing image, just a snapshot in time of some of the active wildfires that were seen in the west, in Idaho, in Oregon, in Cal Northern California, Washington. And um, John mentioned that I got my PhD in Oregon and I, you know, I studied forest ecology in Oregon. The average fire return for many of the forests that were burning in 2020 is on the order of several hundred years. So this is this is a this is out of the normal to have this many fires happening at once in some of these forested ecosystems. You had places like um, San Francisco looking like Mars. Um, this is a, a pro the approximate number of acres that burned across the West in the 2020 fire year, about nine million acres. That's almost an unimaginable number. It is a record uh, for the United States, but particularly alarming is the number of large fires. So fires the size of the city of Phoenix. You know, we had about 10 of them uh, happening during that fire season. So we're getting more area burned, but we're also getting larger fires. And then we, then we hit 2020. And uh, this is when we thought that this would be the worst thing that happened in 2020. <laughs> back in January, um, we started to see Australia burn. And at the end of the day, after Australia burned, we actually burned, it burned 46 million acres. So just to put in context, we know about the importance of the fires in our Western ecosystems, that's 9 million compared to what happened in Australia, 46 million. So we are seeing numbers that we have not seen before. So let's back up. Um, fire has a very complicated uh, pattern on the landscape. Don't worry about what the legend is, just sort of squint and you see all of the colors from blues to reds to greens. Um, this basically just shows the different uh, fire rotations or the kind of period of time that we would expect fire to return to a same place on, a, on the landscape. And there's tremendous variability, right? So not every place has seen fire occur in the same way. And that's due to all sorts of factors from climate to vegetation type, the kind of fuels that are there. There is pattern to fire. And we, as a geographer, we call that pyrogeography, right? You have to understand the relationship of fire in that place. So down in the Southwest of uh, the United States, say in Arizona and New Mexico, home of Smoky Bear, um, you would classically see, you know, if you went back to the 1800s, you could see the image on the right, the black and white image of a very open ponderosa pine ecosystem with a grass understory. Um, in the presence of smoky, well, and in that system, the fire would be normally carried by the fuels in the understory, so the grasses, and the thick bark of the ponderosa pine protects the trees from, uh, from actually having substantial damage. Um, and so the fire travels down the, on the understory, burns the understory and kills it, but the trees are still alive and the understory then recovers. And that cycle can repeat um, as frequently as every two to five years. And that would, has traditionally been common, um, at least when Euro uh, settlers came into this region. The image on the bottom left is sort of the post smoky uh, image of what these forests look like. So if you take fire out of that system, fire that used to come every two to five years, and then you don't give it fire for 50 to 100 years, you start to have little trees grow up as they would, right? <laughs> but the problem now is that when you get a fire in that landscape, 
it tends to burn up into the canopy, into the trees, because we have these smaller trees that actually we call them uh, ladder fuels. Um, and so they will carry the flames up into the, the treetops of the older mature trees. And then you get a real conflagration. You get a lot of wildfire happening and you can start to burn uh, much more um, uh, severely. On the other hand, and I'm gonna take you now on a little trip to the Yellowstone ecosystem where I've done a lot of work over the past few, gosh, decades now, I guess. Um, in these systems, um, wildfires that reach the canopy are actually common. And we know that by looking at fallen records, we look at uh, the, the charcoal records, and we can go back 10,000 years, the entire quaternary period. And we know that fires returned about every 100 to 300 years. So a lot longer return interval than in the Southwest, but when they did, they came back really hot. They killed all of the trees. And in response, trees have adapted to that. So they have cones that, uh, here's, well, sorry, I'll show you a picture of the cones in a second, but basically they have these evolutionary adaptations that allow them to reseed naturally. So if anyone visited Yellowstone in the, you know, after the large fires of 1988, you might've seen signs like this and vistas like this on the bottom right, where you start to see, you know, a large number of trees actually recovering in, into these burned stands. So while the news was claiming that the, you know, our world, the world's first national park, and technically Yellowstone is the world's first national park um, established in 1872, when it started to burn, 40% um, of it burned and the media got very concerned that these large ecosystems were burning up national treasures, right? Um, this is a aerial image of some of the burned area uh, taken from a helicopter right after the 1988 uh, uh, fires. You can see how large they were, but there are also areas that weren't burned, right? There are some areas that remained green. So it actually recreated pattern on the landscape. Here's another uh, GIS image of this. In the red are all of the fire areas, the perimeters in 1988, and in the orange are the previous 100 years. So you can see some pockets of orange you know, scattered throughout, but, but you can see the mark of, of this fire year. We had relative humidities of less than 5% and gusts of wind up to 40 miles an hour. Uh, you can even see directionality. If you look at sort of the directionality of these fire perimeters, you can see that the winds were coming from the southwest and creeping to the northeast. Um, it wasn't actually stopped until snow uh, came in September. So here, here's what I was talking about in terms of these evolutionary adaptations that trees have uh, um, created to uh, cope with large wildfire. Um, in logical pine trees in Yellowstone, many of them have serotonous cones, which means that the cones are actually closed with a resin and they, they don't open until the, um, they melt through a fire. So you have to have a really hot fire come in and it will actually pop the cones open and release the seed. So these trees are dependent on wildfire to come through before they can regenerate. Now, some logical pine species um, take their chances. Uh, those who have maybe, um, if they're at higher elevations, they're less likely to experience fire. And so they take their chances with dropping a few seeds every so often. Um, and so you have these different ev evolutionary strategies for trees to, to cope with these wildfires. Um, some of my research has happened in these ecosystems following fire. And um, you can start to see how an ecosystem over time uh, can, can recover and can actually be resilient to some of these even severe large wildfires. So this is a plot that we worked in. Uh, you can see that tremendously hot fire. I don't know if you can see these two logs here crossing in the middle. You can see how they are burned out in the middle. That's where the two, two logs cross each other. The heat, just like in your campfire, you know, becomes so hot that where they touch, it, it really is, is um, searing and they're completely gone right at that point. So you can tell how hot that fire was when it came through here. You can also start to see, you know, two years after the fire, some vegetation coming back. And, you know, one of the things we did in the field was to actually go out and count the, the seedlings that were coming back and to look at the soil condition. So this is two years after fire. Uh, this is the same location, slightly different angle, but the same location 10 years after fire very different look and feel, right? Now all of the trees, the dead trees that were standing have fallen over and um, you're starting to see some trees coming back. And if you look 
closely at this picture, you can start to see trees coming into the ecosystem. You see lupine um, vegetation, which actually returns nitrogen to the system. This is a nutrient limited system. So this is part of the successional dynamics to get this understory back to prime the soil. Um, and so this is sort of happening as it might have over the past 10,000 years. And then this is the same location 17 years following the fire. So this is not a system that was destroyed by wildfire. This is a system that was actually resilient to wildfire. And if you were to come back 300 years later, this is what that ecosystem would look like. Mature forests that you might find on the upper plateau in, in Yellowstone. Now I'm going to show you just a couple of data slides, not too many, I promise. Um, but this is a this graph shows the amount of total ecosystem. This is a nitrogen, but you can think of it as biomass if you want. And then this is through stand age. So I remember I said mature stands tend to be about 300 years or so. And that the fire return period for the Yellowstone forest is around 150 to 300 years, okay? Now, right after the fire, the stand age is gonna be zero. And we can look at how much biomass is in our live pools our dead pools and our soil pools through time. And basically all of this graph is showing you is that it recovers all of the, the biomass, all of the nutrients by about a hundred years. So it seems like even if we don't have to just look at those pictures to say it, we can quantify that and say that the ecosystem basically has returned to a pre-fire state by about hundred to 150 years. And guess what, bam, that is what the fire return interval has been through the past 10,000. So the system is, cued to recover on time scales that we expect it to be perturbed. And so that's an ecosystem imbalance. However, you know that, that was a hard thing to sell to the academic community of wildfire because Smoky Bear was so large, right? And, and these wildfires are really damaging and bad. But we would say, well, actually in some places, these are normal. These, I mean, these systems have the capacity to recover. But following a lot of that work, what we actually started to see was uh, the influence and the fingerprint of climate. So recent work was showing that the, um, the drying out of our Western systems was actually causing fires to be different. Um, and the larger drier fire, I'm sorry, the, the drier years, the hotter years were associated with those larger fires. So that made us ask questions about like, well, what if those climate conditions kept coming back? in different, you know, more frequent phases, the same kind of conditions that we experienced in 1988, what if they kept coming back more frequently? So we did that analysis and here you can see, this is the, in the bottom dotted line is the total area of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem that burned in 1988. Um, and then, and this is the total greater Yellowstone vegetated area. And these little lines here are just kind of when you start to see fires, so the potential of, it's actually burned area. And what we're seeing is that you know, by mid-century, by 2050, we're seeing all of the um, burned area creeping up to equal and exceed the area burned in 1988 and almost be all of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So while these are probabilistic scenarios, it's basically showing the propensity for burned area to increase um, because of the association of hotter, drier conditions in the future. And then final data slide on that, uh, again, this is sort of the blob of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem that includes the park of Yellowstone as well as Grand Teton and all the surrounding national forests. So that's what this blob is here. Um, and here we have three climate scenarios, three climate, oops, sorry, three climate models. And here we have rows of different um, climate decades. And the colors are the fire rotation years. So blue is 120 years or more. Remember, that's about the fire return we'd expect to see in the historical period. Um, and by mid-century, we just look here on this column here, what we're seeing is that the fire expected fire rotation is now less than 20 to 30 years. So a dramatic decline in the expected fire return interval from the 120 to about 30 years on average. So these are some of our concerns. Like this was a system that we thought was resilient. Uh, to fire because of those evolutionary adaptations of the vegetation. But now we're seeing the fire coming back every 20 years. What's gonna happen then? And is that realistic? These are only model scenarios. Unfortunately, um, that 17 year old fire image that I showed you just earlier with all those uh, trees that had come back and we saw were resilient. 
Um, that same stand burned 17 years after. So that on one side, I was showing you, if I can go back actually, showing you, oops, sorry, this stand here, that's 17 years. While you look the other direction, I probably walked um, 50 meters away to the other side. And this is what that stand looks like now. So we are actually seeing these fires play out into, uh, as to what our models would suggest, where we're seeing fire return intervals come much more frequently. And then we worry about the systems being able to recover. And you can see here, clearly, um, a, a more moon-like landscape, difficult for seeds to recover. Although there were some in there. Um, we also uh, have other, other kind of positive feedbacks in the system. This is cheat grass. So this is um, an invasive grass that actually promotes fire in the understory and it's coming in. Um, you can see the Tetons in the background there. So it's coming in um, into sort of open areas, but we have now observed it up at 2000 meters elevation into subalpine forested systems. So when this comes into the open uh, understory, it can tend to promote uh, fire uh, even more. And so that's, that's a factor that we are concerned about. So what a lot of my the work in my lab is, is trying to understand is as you look out on a landscape like this, this is part of the greater Yellowstone just south of the Tetons, um, you start to see fire's history stamped onto the landscape. And you can start to ask questions like, where in the landscape should managers manage for resilience? You know, should they actively um, think about uh, assisting regeneration in these systems? And where might that be most effective as a management strategy? So we're really thinking about recovery now and what are the, the, the traits that would allow for recovery. Okay, so in the last part, what I'd like to do is sort of take us from the Western United States uh, and actually a little closer to home. Uh, look at the Mid-Atlantic region. This is a map now not of fire history, but of something we call the wildland urban interface. It's lovingly called the WUI. Um, this is the uh, interface between where humans are living and fire prone forests. And obviously there are more people in the East. So you can see here in the East, all of the, uh, the oranges and reds, anywhere it's sort of orange and red, there's more intermingling of people within forested landscapes. Obviously out West, we have heard about the wildfires encroaching onto communities, but there's a lot of area in the West that's managed by the National Forest Service or BLM and doesn't have a lot of people on it. But in the East, we have a lot of people, okay? And that can also be shown by this image here. This is the land ownership across the United States. All of the red in the West are federal lands. So you can see all of this federal land ownership. In the East, we have a much more heterogeneous mix. We have a lot of uh, private land. The green are sort of family or private uh, lands. And then we also have a lot of industrial forest lands in blue, uh, intermingled with state and federal lands as well. And also actually, if you look at Pennsylvania, you see we have a lot of state game lands as well here, here in our Pennsylvania landscape. So you have this very tight intermingling of different land ownerships and different people living in the forested ecosystem. So managing fire in the East, should it occur, is a little different than if you were to manage it in the West. And again, that's the challenge, the sort of social challenge of, of fire. I can come back to that in a minute. But I wanted to just share a bit about um, some of our recent work that's just concluding where we looked at fire in the mid-Atlantic, um, specifically in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Now we don't associate wildfire with our Pennsylvania landscapes, but, um, but it can happen and has happened historically. In some parts of New Jersey, however, where we have pitch pine ecosystems, wildfire is actually quite common. And there was recently a Rolling Stone article uh, with this headline, you know, will America's worst wildfire disaster happen in New Jersey? This might not be the largest fire, we would ever see, but it's happening in New Jersey where you have a lot of people living, right? And New Jersey's not that big. And so if you have something happening in the pine lands, it can go to the suburbs of Philadelphia literally within 24 hours. So if you think of the time scale of the news cycle of these fires of how much time it takes to put them out in the West, 
you know, you get a large conflagration in uh, New Jersey and it's a lot harder to, uh, to put out and it's likely to do a lot more damage as well. So this was an uh, image of a wildfire at a very strange sort of pattern. Um, we can talk about that, but it, it actually occurred uh, during the course of our study in one of the, the lands that is managed by the New Jersey Forest Fire Service. So wildfire does happen in New Jersey. Um, and you know, not too far away, in a few years ago, the Gatlinburg fire in Tennessee uh, actually destroyed whole communities uh, and people, people were killed. I think 14 people were killed. Um, whole communities uh, and tourism was, was also uh, really hurt by this. Uh, you had communities that had one way in, one way out kind of structures. Um, and it really stunned the community that a wildfire could come in the east. Uh, this is a slightly drier ecosystem uh, than what we have in Pennsylvania. But you know, as climate changes, we start to ask questions like, well, that's not that far away. You know, we could drive there. Um, how would there ever be a case for that in, in Pennsylvania? But the other reason to think about fire in Pennsylvania is that we're really interested in um, preserving biodiversity on the landscape. And what we're seeing is that oak species in particular are, are going away and they're being replaced by maple, uh, red maple in particular. And the red maple is kind of invading into the understory and out competing the oak. And so there's a lot of interest in returning oak to the landscape. And this is because for lots of reasons, having removed fire from the Pennsylvania landscape, um, the oak is not regenerating very well. So how do we you know, actively manage for oak? Well, one of the ways we do that is by using controlled burning, which is otherwise called prescribed fire. So prescribing uh, like a medicine to the forest, uh, this low uh, intensity fires that would promote the regeneration of oak. So we've been working with managers in the game lands. This is right here behind, behind you in the Scotia uh, Game Barrens. This is our pitch pine ecosystem, the same kind of ecosystem, uh, tree types that you might see in New Jersey. And then we also have sort of adjacent to this pitch pine system, a lot of oak systems. And so these are some of the fire managers we worked with where they are actively putting fire back on the landscape in a way that they can promote that oak habitat. So this is not just for biodiversity. Actually, the Nature Conservancy was involved because they're interested in biodiversity. But it's also because these oak and hickory stands actually support game species. So they support deer, they support quail, they support turkey and pheasants. And this is something, you know, hunting is really important, obviously, to our game lands. And so the Pennsylvania Game Commission was really didn't want to lose their habitat. And the way to protect it is by putting fire back on the landscape. So there's lots of reasons for burning. In Pennsylvania, it's less about wildfire risk as it is about returning certain types of forests to the landscape. And then in New Jersey, it's a little bit more about wildfire risk. So we talked with managers. We held focus groups um, and discussions with managers, as well as communities called Firewise communities. So these are communities that um, uh, solicit for some support to help manage their own communities in the face of wildfire threats. And we asked them, you know, what do you wish the public knew about fire management in this area? We don't have the lens that we might have in, in the West where fire is on everybody's you know, to-do list. Um, here, here, it's just not something people talk about that much. And yet managers wanted to put fire back on the landscape without scaring people, right? And doing it in a way that was safe. And so um, through that work, I'm gonna take you through just a couple of responses that we heard from, from these managers about, about what they see as barriers and opportunities for putting fire back on the landscape. So one of these factors is kind of landscape level factors. The fact that we have um, landscapes that are very fragmented, there's a lot of infrastructure all over the place, right? Um, and so one manager said, there are transportation, communication, AT&T cables, cellular sites, gas lines, lines going from America to Europe, underneath the ocean, billions of dollars. And conceivably, if we have a major fire or a series of major fires, that can disrupt a lot of things, not just in New Jersey, but probably throughout the whole country. So these are landscape level planning questions, right? Well, how do you manage, get fire back in the landscape safely when you've got all of this infrastructure in the way? 
Uh, the second factor uh, that's sort of a high barrier to putting fire back on the landscape safely are these differences across institutions. So one manager in referring to other managers said, you know, other managers are charged with pine snakes or raptors or bats or plants and they are managing it by the square feet, not recognizing the landscape level approach and they are inflexible with that. So what this is referring to is that some organizations, you know, are responsible for certain species um, aren't really thinking about fire as a management tool, but really want to preserve a bat and are concerned about what fire might do to that bat. So we have differences across institutions. And then, you know, planning for this. Um, they want to plan and they want to put fire on the landscape in, um, in a, a broad tracks, right? We are trying to educate our resource folks that governing larger tracks is better, easier, and more cost effective, but that's really hard to do. Then we have community level factors, like we're running into more and more issues now as different groups moving into New Jersey, retirement people and or other people that are not familiar with the burning. So this idea of limited experience in New Jersey in particular, they have a lot of people coming down from New York who are retiring into the New Jersey landscape and really don't have an understanding of fire history in the region. Um, however, there are also some really interesting private public partnerships that are, are existing here. So cranberry farming is a big industry in New Jersey and cranberry farmers are actually active partners with the fire managers. So a uh, New Jersey manager says, we support them, the cranberry farmers with whatever they need. Any burnt ground that they are accomplishing is gonna help us as far as hazard reduction. You know, it's in our best interest to support them. So you have these really interesting groups coming together, public and private to, uh, to understand how to put fire safely back on the landscape. In Pennsylvania, we felt a little, we found a little more resistance, right? People don't realize that if somebody's gonna come and burn your land, it costs money. And now as soon as they hear that, they say, oh, okay, I'm out. And that's because of the large amount of private land we have in Pennsylvania. And so it's really hard to, um, to get people to burn on private lands if there's no incentives and no um, skilled uh, workforce to do it for them. And then um, here's, here's another sort of hard thing that I mentioned that we talked with the Firewise communities and these are communities that are meant to build cohesive social networks that allow that education to occur. Um, and one person's from that group said, our biggest reason I would say that we jumped on Firewise is we had such a disconnect in a very small community. Nobody knows anything about anybody on the street or who lives next door. They, would, they know nothing. So in an emergency, it would be complete and utter chaos. So how do you develop those relationships that support communities that might be under threat from wildfire? Um, and I'll just quickly go to the last couple here because um, we also saw some things happening at the individual level. So people's individual relationship with fire um, you know, people are busy and they're working and you say, where is a wildfire on your list of things that you're afraid of? They'll put it down as a zero to one, right? They don't really care <laughs> about wildfire. So it's hard for managers to, to talk about it. Or they think of fire in the West. They think of those major fires in California. Um, and they also sort of say, well, actually you don't need a wildfire so the size of the, that that happens in California to destroy your home. A single you know, fire can do that. So how do you how do you kind of combat those those understandings? But then we also saw a lot of care and trust um, being uh, represented in what people were saying about each other, about communities and managers. Uh, if we saved one home or saved one firefighter from having to go that, to that home, it's worth it for that firefighter's life. So a lot of respect by homeowners, um, you know, and and those who understand the fire problem to work with managers to provide uh, them some safety. So you put that all together, it's a complex social and ecological factor um, in terms of stewarding management on the landscape. Unfortunately, um, I have to report that just uh, like 10 days ago, there was a large wildfire in New Jersey and one, wild, one firefighter uh, was actually critically injured. It burned only, only 170 acres, but that's pretty big, again, given the really complex uh, situation in New Jersey. Um, and it was in a populated area. So we had structures that, that were burnt. Um, and so this is happening in New Jersey now. And so the, the Martian moonscapes that we think are happening just in San Francisco, well, you know, they're happening in New Jersey now. Uh, and so th these are things we need to be aware of um, and we need to do a better job of preparing our communities for these kinds of situations. So I'll just close now. I, I just, this is a neat kind of graphic. It goes back 
billions of years, the uh, beginning of the earth. Um, and it shows how we kind of used energy throughout all of earth's history. Um, and it has this little uh, sort of spirally uh, image here that we went from using just geochemical energy to sunlight, to oxygen, to flesh. Um, and now finally we're using fire, we're using combustion as fossil fuels, we're using combustion and dealing with fire in terms of, of biomass. And, uh, and so these are, we're in the fire era now. This is how we are managing our landscape and our energy resources. So it's been called the pyrocene. And I'll just close with this image of Prometheus. Um, you know, Prometheus's fate of giving the gift of fire to human civilization, which again promoted civilization, allowed us to cook our food and, and so forth. Um, you know, his, his fate was being tied to a rock and having his liver being eaten out every day again and again by an eagle. Um, and so he was forever punished by, by the gods. So make that make of that as, as you would like. <laughs> um, Here's a quote about that. For it is because I bestowed good gifts on mortals that this miserable yoke of constraint has been bound upon me. I hunted out and stored in fennel stock the stolen source of fire that has proved a teacher to mortals in every art and a means to mighty ends. Such is the offense for which I pay the penalty riveted in fetters beneath the open sky. And I'm just gonna sort of close on that because I do think fire is a teacher a teacher to mortals. Um, it teaches us uh, you know, some humility in terms of how, how we're going to uh, develop a more robust relationship with fire in the future. Mm -hmm. So I will stop there. I wanna thank all of my colleagues who helped and contributed to that as well as the Joint Fire Science Program that supported some of the work in uh, the New Jersey area. So thanks everybody. Well, thank you, Erica. That was great, fascinating. Do we have any questions out there? Does anybody here have any questions? No questions in the community room. Well, I have a question. And okay. Erica, we actually talked about this at the Wilson banquet several years ago, but what is the role or the effect of wildfires here in the Northeast on our tick population? Yes, very good question. Um, I don't know what I answered four years ago or whatever, but I will try. Um, it's actually really, really interesting. And there is a lot of active research happening. So the when we asked community members, and I didn't show this part of the work, but we also had trailhead surveys where we asked people who are walking around the forest, um, you know, why, what do you think about putting fire here? You know, what do you see as potential benefits? What do you see as potential risks? And this could be anything from losing recreational access to the visibility of the forest, doesn't look pretty, that kind of thing. And one of the things we asked about was ticks. I and mean, it was on a long list and uh, people were very concerned and they, if, you know, they saw a benefit of putting fire on the landscape and tick reduction. Um, it was actually number one. Number one, in terms of what the community saw as a benefit. So that's a really important message to managers. You know, I, I talked about the challenge of messaging around putting fire back on the landscape and, oh, it's good for the ecology and oak regeneration. Like, if you just talk about ticks, people get on board <laughs> and they're like, yes, that sounds great. But the truth is, the problem is that the... Um, the science is not there yet 100%. So we, mm -hmm. we do know that there is some change in tick populations in the immediate post-fire year or two. So mm -hmm. there is some ticks kind of can move out of the system. It depends on the heat. Um, ticks can burrow under leaves. And so if there's not a very hot flame, it might not happen. Um, but they, there is seem to be some reduction. But in the case of Pennsylvania, what we're doing is we're promoting um, more open systems that allow game species to come in. Mm -hmm. Those game species are also the hosts for mm -hmm. the tick. Yeah. So, um, you know, while we might have a short term reduction, we're actually promoting the trophic interactions that allow the, the tick to actually survive long term. Mm -hmm. So the jury's still out in terms of the long-term influence on, on this, but it, it certainly deserves more study because it's of great interest. And of course, it's not, you know, not all ticks are the same. So there's different impacts on the different ticks. Mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll follow up with a, a similar question. Okay. Is there any known effect of wildfires on chronic waste disease migration? Not that I'm aware of. Um, you mean the disease itself or the deer population? Well, I mean, uh, you know, the deer carry it with them. Yeah. And frequently 
uh, it's picked up, as I understand it, from uh, the fluids and whatnot on the forest floor. Yeah. And so if you have a wildfire, are those uh, fluids or whatever transmitted uh, destroyed? Yes, I don't. A lot of the chronic wasting disease um, is happening in areas that aren't actually seeing a lot of fire. Um, so mm -hmm. I think you're, you're. I think that's an unexamined question as to whether if you did more active fire management, would you see a reduction in that? I think, however, the larger question is sort of the overabundance of deer in the ecosystem right. and mm -hmm. the sort of mass eating areas where they can yep. collect the, the, or you know transmit the disease. So. Um, the larger question is around deer management and the role of hunting and deer management. I think that's probably going to have a larger effect than, gotcha. than the fire itself. Good. John, John Forrest here. Go ahead. Professor Smithwick, I go back to a graph you had when you were talking about Yellowstone, <clears throat> and it shows a projection out to the year 2100 in a yeah. simple mine of, I guess, consumption of the ecosystem, uh, exceeding that of the 1988 fire. Right. You stated that the reason for that continued growth was due to drier climate. But there are many in your college that believe that there is global warming. Your simple mind, higher air temperatures mean more evaporation. More evaporation means more rainfall. So what's the basis of your hypothesis that it's going to be drier in years to come? Great question. So the the first of all, to back up on that particular graph, what we were talking about there is looking at the kinds of weather and climate conditions, I should say, I guess, climate conditions, um, that caused the fires to occur in 1988. And then we saw how frequently those conditions occurred in the future under the climate model scenarios. And so if you assume, and this is an assumption that we talked about in the paper itself, if you assume the same relationship between those climate conditions and fuels, that that persists, that you can just sort of draw a line into the future. Now, uh, what we talk about is actually the paper talks about mid-century because we really didn't want to make projections all the way to 2100 because we actually thought if fires are coming that frequently, you might actually lose fuels, right? And you might not have enough fuel to burn. Now, again, I did just show you a graph that you can burn 20-year-old stands and so you can still you can still see that. But, but that is why we didn't, we were cautious in sort of making those projections out past mid-century because there's a lot of other factors that, that come into play. But the root of your question is sort of the relationship between climate and drying and, and fire. And I can say historically through observations, we've, we've shown that, that the, uh, as the systems dry, they're more prone to wildfires. And so if a system is experiencing more heat and there is, well, okay, there's two factors actually. It can dry, it can be just hotter. And the, as you say, the, um, it will, there'll be more transpiration from the trees and more evaporation from open surfaces. Unfortunately, that does not translate into precipitation in that location. Um, there might be more water vapor in the atmosphere that actually is a positive feedback on global warming. And some places are gonna see more storms, more activity, more, I mean, there is gonna be more water, but it's unfortunately not gonna be in the areas that are losing it um, as based on what we're, what we're seeing. So, it's drying out and the vegetation is not benefiting from that. It's just getting drier and drier. So that's one factor. The other factor is not just the hotter temperatures in the summer during the fire season, but it's also the lower snowpack. So in these particular areas, the subalpine ecosystems, we're really concerned about lower snow in the winter. And actually winters are warming faster than summers. And so we're getting uh, shorter springs with less um, water feeding into the, into the streams and into the soil hydrology. And that is actually causing a lot of drying into the forested ecosystems. Does that help? It helps, thank you. You're welcome. Very good, any more questions? No questions here. One last one from me, Erica. Okay. What's the prognosis for this year's wildfire season in Pennsylvania? We had a well, rather wet winter, but yeah. Um, so we in Pennsylvania, we um, 
you know, it's very dependent on these short windows of time. So, so we had a pretty wet year last year. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes a wet year will oscillate with a dry year and cause more wildfire risk because the wet year builds up the fuels mm -hmm. and then you have a dry year and then it actually creates more risk. What mm -hmm. I've seen is the, the same wildfire that caused, um, sorry, the weather conditions that caused the wildfire just a couple of weeks ago in New Jersey um, mm -hmm. was because we actually had a fire weather day that was like, we hardly ever see those with high winds and really mm -hmm. dry conditions. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of portends that we might see a few more of those, I think, uh, the rest the rest of the year. Okay. But again, these these you don't have to have a full long season of drought all the, the way through. You can have a couple week, a week of drying, like a week of drought mm -hmm. and these really high wind events. And that can actually fan the flames, literally. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh, I see a question from Joan. Yes, please. Oh, I can't oh, hear you, you're Joan. You're on mute. I don't think she's on mute, though. Oh, maybe your microphone's not working, Joan. Wait a moment. Oh, we got now you. Now we hear you. Now we hear you. OK, good. Thank you. I got closer to my uh, computer. Sorry, my face is so big. I don't mean to be in your face, but I lost my transmission, my internet, and I just got back on it. I don't know if anybody has asked this question, so if they have, I apologize. But I didn't hear the answer since I wasn't there, so I'm going to ask it again. Um, I'm wondering about the effect on wildlife um, that have no place else to go because their habitat has already gotten constricted, like, you know, the yeah. um, pit and the pendulum scenario. And I'm also worried about all the carbon, uh, uh, you know, um, dioxide that gets released into the atmosphere more frequently. Uh, and I'm wondering if we can even afford to have these events happen despite yeah. um, what uh, you have told us about, and uh, it's understandable about how beneficial it is for the uh, ecostructure, you know, right there. Now, not only the danger for the intermixing of people living closer to where the fires might be, but those other two, and also the problem with tourism in New Jersey and, you know, Yellowstone, is, is this even viable to yeah. let this um, a cycle keep on going? in uh, relationship to where we are in the world right now. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, definitely something that we think about a lot. Uh, the, you know, there's been some work to suggest that while you might lose some carbon through these sort of managed fires in the short term, you're avoiding the large wildfire risk that could be the larger, the larger event. And so the net balance is that your carbon is negative over the long term. OK, now that doesn't necessarily mean, um, you know, that you're, you're solving the problem in 10 years, because unfortunately, that's what we need to be doing. So. Um, so, yeah, there is a net cost, a net carbon emissions. Um, if 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 this is an important if you are going from a forest that had more biomass to a forest that had less biomass. So if you can recover all the biomass, like within a year after a fire, like a low intensity burn, and you're just killing the understory and that comes back the next year, then, then it's okay. But if you have a forest like the Yellowstone system that might take a hundred years to get back all that biomass, then it's a different, then it's a different carbon story. So what we're finding in Pennsylvania, um, we, my colleague, Alan Taylor has done some modeling um, on that in association with our project is that um, the carbon balance of, of managed fire in Pennsylvania um, is actually positive. I mean, it's good for the system. It actually enhances carbon storage, except for um, the situations when you want to restore pitch pine, which requires such frequent burning. And you're taking a system that has much more like trees in it, much more oak and, and maple in the forest now, and you're putting it to that sparse pitch pine ecosystem that frankly just has less biomass in it. It might be a, we might want to do that for biodiversity considerations because it supports different kinds of animals, different kinds of habitats across the landscape. Um, but that's a, that's a value trade-off. We might actually lose carbon storage, but we gain biodiversity. So um, these are real societal questions uh, that I think we do need to be having as per your question. Um, in terms of the wildlife bit, we also in asking people that question, what do you care about? Other than ticks, wildlife is the other thing people care about, uh, rightly so. 
In the Yellowstone system, uh, we didn't eat, lose a lot of animals directly from the wildfire. They rebounded uh, quite quickly in a year or two after the fire. Uh, the main threat was not actually the fire itself, but the reduction of, um, of uh, prey and, and sort of a harsh winter the following year. And so finding food resources that did more damage than the fire itself. Mm -hmm. But you have places like Australia where you have koalas and, you know, this, <laughs> I hate to breathe, you know, the harbinger of the big cute animals, you know, that's not only about that, but it, but that's an example of an animal that is not adapted to wildfire in the same way and is vulnerable um, and actually can, can, you know, that population can be severely threatened. So when you have increasingly rare animals on the landscape, um, those might be cases where, you know, active fire management is not something you want to be, want to be doing. So yeah, every one of these decisions is multi-layered and, you know, I think, you know, each, each, um, uh, I want to say community, but you know, I think there has to be policy that's flexible to take into account some of these different value systems. Yeah, uh, like Overall, the sloth, like, like yeah, the sloth the, in South like America. Sloth, right, yeah. I will say one other thing, though, on the carbon bit, which is that globally, carbon emissions are actually going down from wildfire. So globally, we're actually reducing our emissions from wildfires, and that's because of urbanization and changing livelihoods. So people aren't burning for agricultural reasons the same way they used to. They're going to the, the supermarket. So um, while... Wildfire emissions are actually not um, the main contributor to carbon in the atmosphere. It's fossil fuels. Um, you know that's really where we need to be putting our our um, our discussion, right? We, we the the wildfire emissions are going to be locally very very large, as we just saw, um, but they globally they're they're going down. So the real the real contributor to carbon emissions is are going to be the fossil fuels. Thank you very much for that excellent answer. Okay. Well, thank you, Erica. This was fascinating. I hope everybody enjoyed it. And stay tuned for our April uh, presentation, which will be by uh, Professor Bill Brune, where he'll be talking about lightning-induced chemistry in the atmosphere. And I believe that's on April 22nd. So thanks again, Erica. And uh, I owe you a lunch. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you, you very much. much.